I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with Section 419, The Omega Seed, by Paolo Soleri. We're continuing Book 6, Technological Frankenstein and the Delphic Oracle. A Better Quality of Wrongness? Synopsis. Feasibility and desirability are often incompatible. A technocratic society has an irresistible penchant toward feasibility, which always couples with the market feasibility will it sell. We'll see to it that it does. The ethos of such society becomes dangerously mediocre, and mediocrity wears poorly with evolution. A better quality of wrongness is the passport to obsolescence and death. The Gross National International Pollution What is the major frustration of Western man? The ability to do so much and achieve so little. The ability to manipulate so much matter, consume so much energy, and watch his own spirit wither away. Homo faber triumphant, homo sapiens humiliated. It is, in the largest frame of reference, as if vindictive matter were set upon the destruction of the spirit. Even the political animal feels the malaise. He, at least, though seldom, speaks of quality above quantity. He means that all the paraphernalia with which we surround ourselves should be better made, longer lasting, more attractive. He says that we must move from a gross, gross national product to a refined gross national product, or ever more massive proportions. But this might just be the advocacy of learning how to do better the wrong things, a better quality of wrongness. It is like wrapping a sin inside a disaster, and there, by the way, lies some of the ambiguity of the Nader Crusade. Must man's well-being be provided by this mountain of things in power, or that better mountain of things in power? Or is his well-being dependent on a better grasp of his participatory position in the physical and metaphysical environment, and consequently, on his desire and capacity to act within it? Is there something to the idea that our manufactured world, this tidal wave of cunningly manipulated matter, this endless list of labor-saving devices or so-called labor-saving devices and playthings, this physical opulence might in the long run be not a blessing but a curse? It is true that we, the human species, among the other species are the bridge between matter and spirit. It might stand to reason that the backpack of manipulated matter we load ourselves with can only be so heavy if we want to continue with the construction of such a bridge. A better quality of wrongness gives man an even worse handicap. It is the most massive kind of pollution, environmental and mental, we can give ourselves. It could be termed an entropic backpack, not only carried willingly on our backs, but paid for willingly by our daily toil. We came to agree quite a while ago that the most valuable characteristic of man is his own non-specialization. We are generalists, and one of our concerns should be to keep open as many options on the future as we can. It seems, however, that we have become addicted to the specialization of dependence. Every one of our acts is dependent on a chain of instrument energy performances, which become bulkier and more unique, not in singularity, because the pride of democracy is in number, but in specialization. Even in trivia like toothbrushing or meat cutting, we advance far into the realm of umbilical cords and connections, conditioning a simple direct act on and with a remote and polluting power source. The more inclusive an undertaking, the greater its potential for good and evil. If such undertaking belongs to wrongness, all that it covers will contribute to more of the same wrongness. Let's consider, for example, earth-moving equipment. Each new generation of bulldozers, scrapers, excavators, or trencheners is an improved, more beautiful group of equipment able to move more tonnage per unit of cost and energy time. One would deduce that this is where etherealization is fostered. Unfortunately, as wrong as a purpose is the overriding force, the greater the efficiency, the greater the evil. Our independence seems to be conditioned, glued in fact, to an ever-increasing dependence. The glue that defrauds of a clear consciousness of this dependence is money. As long as we can depend on the ability of money to keep our dependency solvent, we call ourselves independent. But it is one of the characteristics of money to keep open those cycles that do not produce immediate reward, and that is how we set up a future full of punishment. Unfortunately, reality, of which we in nature are part, does not recognize symbols. It recognizes only the dynamics which stand or fall on the foundation of the laws of mass energy, thermodynamics, biology, etc., and the rigor of its bookkeeping is unforgiving. That is why we find ourselves living in a kind of utopian, unreal world. Our future-oriented makeup, the cantilever out from the mind, the intrinsic ability of man to plan what should ensure the fullness of such future, is overloaded with a ballast of poor quality of wrongness, now being challenged not by a leaner conscience, 
but by a more self-righteous one. The qualitative upbeat will not restore the balance in favor of the spirit. It will simply put another buffer around it, another fraudulent diaphragm between dependent man and the collapse of civilization. The cause of the collapse is the incongruence of a spirited phenomenon man with his unwillingness to equip himself with an effectively frugal technology. It is incongruent with the limited context of the earth, with the critical dosage of physics versus metaphysics required for the best cooperation of the instrument and its master. Physics is technological know-how. Metaphysics is the reverential world of master man. The ecological crisis is really the crisis of the spirit, and in a way, such crises had to be expected. It is the wastefulness inherent in any pioneering venture which has lost view of its aims. Any prototype is a triumph of whatness at the expense of howness, when the effort is in the direction of desirability. It is the opposite, a triumph of howness at the expense of whatness, when such prototype is in the direction of feasibility. Much of the technological revolution went toward feasibility, nurtured by and nurturing greed in a most elegant circle, where desirability became only incidental, when not purely accidental. We suffer for it now, and it will take time to improve things, but things will not improve if we go on unrepentant with the arrogant goal of a better quality of wrongness. A better quality of wrongness would have won the Vietnam War for the states, and God knows how good we were at it. Better quality wrongness would in general give more buying power to every man, woman, and child above the poverty level, with no telling how majestic the suicide of society would be. Better quality wrongness would give another turn of the screw for the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer, as it would make greed more rewarding. Better quality wrongness would make our economic imperialism absolute, where it is now in danger of being obsolete. In general, a better quality of wrongness will be the most direct, secure road to obscurantism by way of opulence and solvency. We have been adamant about economic insolvency. That is the pride of hard-nosed practical man. We are finding out that ecological, that is to say global insolvency, is making the future precarious. Reality is bypassing practical man. The tragedy is that reality is headless if man is not the tip of its thrust. There's no realism whatsoever in our struggle for an environmental future if we do not conceptualize our predicament radically enough. At the root of the dilemma is the sorcery of ours, the ability and proficiency we have for doing the wrong thing, mass-producing wrongness. Optimal marketability stands for the most massive kind of pollution entropy. In its bulk, it implicates the physical, and in its sinfulness, it implicates the metaphysical. With this proficiency in wrongness, we are confronted by the coincidence of two enemies of life, entropy and pollution. Entropy, which is the pollution of life, is also the nemesis of the living environment. To grasp such a relationship is to see the futility of our anti-pollution pro-environment contentions. They concern themselves only with the fringes of the existential dilemma, not with the meat of it. Nor can we act effectively on those fringes if we do not realize that they are fringes. To state it once more, pollution is not the byproduct or waste of our technological cycles. It is too often the technological cycle itself and the, t and the hardware that it produces. Greed easily joins entropy and pollution, as nothing fosters greed more than the open market of free enterprise, where open and free are pseudonyms for monopolized and coerced. This massive production of anti-life is nothing else but the materialization of that which wants to move even further on the path of etherealization, the spirit of man. It's an inner nemesis which stipulates that more goes where the most is already, the western enclaves and only the affluent in these enclaves. It also has an outer nemesis, which is the predisposition to a global catastrophe, where innocent and guilty will perish indiscriminately. Practicality is not the key to a resolution. Practicality has brought about the crisis, and it will evermore engulf life in the morass of non-life. The key is in the reality of evolutionary coherence, which states that more is more only when, consequent to a quantum jump, it can be achieved with less. Which is to say, when spirit has overtaken another province of matter. This happens and can happen only by the power of complexity, when life becomes richer by imploding itself into a new organism able to sustain itself with less of itself and less of the outer. How perfectly this quantum jump fits the global crisis of today can be immediately seen. Only by cutting drastically the demands we impose on the planet can we imagine a hopeful future. Such hope would be destroyed if the cutting would entail a degradation of life. But just as so many times before in the evolutionary process, 
When necessity becomes a virtue, life becomes better than itself. Necessity is frugality, which can only find unequivocal ground on equity. The virtue is an intensity of life never reached before. The methodology for this miracle, as for the myriads of preceding miracles, is the miniaturization process. Pragmatism fails man if he cannot see the starkness and necessity of this methodology. Let's just say that the living is a phenomenon of communication of information, which gives access to knowledge, this, that immaterial stuff which allows, through evolutionary stages, a response to become a conscience. That is the secret of the identity of complexity and conscience, therefore the virtue of miniaturization. Here lies the possibility of a quantum jump, the gate capable of carrying affluence into grace, so as to make it ecologically and ethically fit. This is the electrifying sense of the methodology of life, showing us the straight connection between matter and spirit. Taking matter as outerness, each particle of matter is exterior to all others and interacts with them statistically. Taking spirit as innerness, a sort of polarization of the same particles makes them participatory beyond the statistical rules. It is, in simple terms, as if a certain point of mechanical process would find itself incapable of fulfilling its own deterministic aims because too many digits have appeared. At that critical stage, process ceases, determinism breaks down, and life begins. With it, the outer imposition of determinism itself retreats into the environment to become one half of life's maker, the environment, the other half now being the organism in its inner self. Consciousness then appears as an interiorized universe, as maker and creator of a new universe of the spirit. The following is in italics. This interiorization process is at the threshold of making the cityscape, now only the exterior environment of the city dweller, into an interiority, the interiorized context of the transorganism the city will become. This is a quantum jump and cannot come about if complexity miniaturization is not forcefully operating. The key unlocking one of, by one the doors of the universe of consciousness is the limitless capacity of the organic phenomenon to move from the most elementary organization of matter, so elementary as to be ambiguous, a virus for instance, to the compound miracle of man and his mind by the instrumentality of complexity and miniaturization. It is as if, beyond a critical level of complexity, mass energy metamorphoses into organic psychism. Inherent in the metamorphosis is the relative minuteness of the organism, that is to say, its absolute miniaturization. For this most pragmatic of all important things, the universe of the spirit, the better quality of wrongness is pure unadulterated pollution. It is entropy grinding away at the core of life itself, the inability to grasp the hardest of all hard facts stultifies all our undertakings and puts life itself in jeopardy. An adoption of this proven methodology, three billion or so years of development, would not only strike at the core of our problems, but would transfigure the earth into a more and more spirited phenomenon. Taking our cities as one of the more critical aspects of the environmental spiritual crisis, one could say that if a benevolent god were to take things in hand, he would have two archangels hovering above. The first archangel would siphon off from the city all that which is punishing man, all that which is dead and entropically oriented, a depollution of the organism of the city. The most massive element of such pollution is the automobile cancer, now intimately and dogmatically fused with even the most private events of our society. With it would be taken out the myriads of pollutant futilities that confronted the dread facing most of mankind do not speak kindly of our souls. This depollution in asyntropic surgery would leave voids throughout our cityscape. This is where the second archangel, the archangel of reverence, could come in and restructure the city into something far smaller, far swifter, frugal, ecologically fitting and humanly alive, solvent, mindful, hopeful, and reverential, an environmental fragment of a better quality of rightness. This archaeological commitment is one step in that direction. Thus concludes section 419, A Better Quality of Wrongness. Part of Book 6, Technological, Frankenstein, and Delphic Oracle of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Tomorrow we continue with 420, Nominal Freedom, Contextual Coercion. I'll see you then, alum.